Hello again, it's Cliff here from Down Under. In this video, I'm going to be going through machining this high value prototype part. A very high tolerance requirements and um, the different machining strategies and tips and tricks along the way machining that part up. All right, well, let's look at this part a bit more closely. So it looks like quite a simple part, but the very high uh, tolerance requirements, you know, plus or minus a hundredth of a, hundredth of a millimeter, half a thou on the diameters, very fine tolerances on the squareness, the parallelness, um, and the lengths. And so it's not something you can bash out in a hurry. I really need to think carefully about it because I'll be spending quite a few hours on it. Um, so it's a big relief now this is made, but I'll go, I've taken a series of video clips right from the beginning because it's a very interesting project to discuss different machining strategies. So right at the start, I think it's really important to think about the different ways of making, let's say you've got a prototype part to quote on and it's, uh, you know, it's going to take you quite a few hours, so you want to make the right decision, the right strat machining strategy. You don't want to get halfway through and then find, oh, I never thought of it, I should have done it this other way. It's so depressing when that happens. Um, you want to think of the best way of making it first. So force yourself to sit down with a bit of paper and write down the different alternatives that you can see. You know, actually physically force, I mean, it, it's not actually that easy to do that because human nature is your gut instinct comes up with a way of doing it and you think oh I'll do it that way yep 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 that's going to work and, and away you go and then halfway through the job you think oh no why didn't I think of doing it the other way it would have been a lot quicker so let's look at this part now there's different ways you could do it I mean you could you lay it flat on the table and with a ball nose cutter a 3d profile CNC machine it well, it wouldn't be accurate enough. The uh, tolerance requirements are too high, and uh, even on a high-speed Japanese machine, you just wouldn't get enough precision. It wouldn't work for the threads and the shoulders. It's really a lathe job. It's got to be turned uh, to get the concentricity and the uh, parallelness and so on. So, okay, what are the different options for a lathe machining? Well, it's more about work holding, but your time's going to be spent in a part like this, a one-off part like this, more about work holding, planning, measuring, and, and so on than actual machining time. So it doesn't really matter whether I go a CNC lathe or a manual lathe from the point of view of time. A manual lathe is, is more versatile. I've got face plates, four jaw chucks, and uh, a tailstock. So it's looking like a manual lathe job. So within that, what, what are the different ways of doing it? Well, you could put it in the fourth axis uh, with, a, with your piece of stock and uh, machine the centers. Whoa. Four lots of centers very accurately and then put it between centers in the lathe and uh, machine the various features and then afterwards perhaps slab, slab the squares. That's a, a, a possibility. Another idea is to make it as a rectangular T-shape piece of stock. Finish machine the rectangular surfaces and then you can hold the various flats and machine the, it into a cylindrical shape afterwards. And both of those seem like pretty good options. I eventually decided on the latter, machining it uh, not between centers, but machining it with a, in a rectangular form T-shape and then and then putting it between centers and chucking it and putting it on the face plate and turning it uh, to get the cylindrical form. So it's really worth spending the time forcing yourself to, to lay down all the different steps and stages and where, where the little bottlenecks are, where the problems are, so that you don't paint yourself into a corner, so you don't get three quarters of the way through and realize you've got a problem. How are you gonna do this? Um, think about all the problems with work holding, precision, distortion, and so on along the way. So um, that's one really important lesson. Plan your machining strategy in advance thoroughly. It might only take you a couple of bursts of 10 minutes with a coffee, um, but that's going to save you a huge amount of work and, and a mistake is much less likely if you force yourself to 
do that. Even if your part is to finish up cylindrical, it's often a good idea to first of all precision machine it in a rectac rectangular form with flat surfaces that you can uh, easily reference and locate. For example, this T-shaped part is going to be a high precision cylindrical part, but with the flat surfaces I can slide it around on a faceplate with, a clamp, with clamps and easily dial in its uh, concentricity and its squareness in these different directions. And so I'm taking advantage of the uh, rectangular geometry to get the high precision. And don't be scared to drill threaded holes in your faceplate. Um, it's really just a fixture plate. But just think about where you're putting the holes. Don't put them in places that will weaken the faceplate. Uh, or throw it out of balance, keep them symmetrical and in strong parts of the faceplate. Obviously you'll have to think it through for yourself whether that's a safe thing to do. You don't want to weaken your faceplate. It's much easier to check that your part is parallel and square while it's in its rectangular form and you've got nice convenient flat surfaces to measure. It's easier to check that it's square. I've recently, or I will be, publishing a video on making a squareness comparator. Quite a simple little base that you can use with your dial indicator. And then you can dial in and check the squareness. Hear that washing machine rattling away above me. So there we just pass the zero the 100th dial indicator, rotate it around. We're using it as a squareness comparator here. So that's very good. That's within about one or two microns of square between one side and the other using that squareness comparator. All this sort of work, measuring, machining, and then checking is so much easier when it is flat rectangular with reference surfaces you can check everything and align it much more quickly for most work there's no need to drill and tap a massive hole you know a 10 millimeter or 3 8 thread has got a huge holding force and that will weaken and unbalance your faceplate a lot less Oh, I hate this damp lower hut environment. I run a dehumidifier and I keep everything coated with different types of protectant sprays and still it creeps in from time to time on my beautiful machinery. Oh, I hate it. If you've got any magic solution, put it in the comments under this video. And of course, after you've cleaned the mating surfaces of your uh, faceplate or chuck, Check that it's running true, and before you rush to take a skim cut to get it perfect, are you sure there's not a tiny little bit of swarf or burr in there? This is also a way of checking that you've got that mating surface clean. So once you've got your part clamped very lightly onto a faceplate, you can easily slide it around to get it exactly aligned. So you've just got the clamps nipped up and you can tap it very easily because it can only go in that direction. It can't, whereas with a chuck or some other method of holding it, it can move in all different directions and you never get it dialed in. Well, it seems to take forever. This way you're just on a flat surface, you can dial it in very quickly, you can tap it. Now I use a bit of copper for tapping steel or a bit of wood for tapping aluminium. Make sure your tapping tool is a lot softer than your part or you'll be bruising it. And now you can come in and dial in one side, find the middle, which is the most clockwise or anti-clockwise needle position, back that indicator out the way, spin it round, come back in, and you can very quickly get it within uh, you know, a hundredth of a millimeter quite easily. It's a good idea um, to have your reference number not as zero, 
but as a number. It's much easier to see the difference between 19 and 21 than it is to see the difference between plus zero and minus zero when you're tapping in that last little bit. Well, another great thing about face plate clamping is that when you tighten it up from its nipped position where you're doing the adjusting, when you tighten it up, it doesn't move. Unlike with a chuck or a vice, it shifts and you've got to keep trying to balance that out. Here's a little trick that's worth passing on. And you might be worried when you machine this that the part shifts out of its accurate alignment and uh, you reject your part. It's very unlikely that that will move Clamping over that flat surface over that area is massively rigid, but all the same it pays to be cautious. So there's a bored hole as well as a turned OD here. So if I bore the hole first, that is a transferred dart, a, a data, datum transfer. So now the bored hole is a reference point and I can check the flats one more time that they're both concentric, both the bored hole and the flats. And then when I start to machine the flats away into the outside diameter, I have an inside board hole to retain the concentric datum. If I ever worry that it's shifted, I can check it before I take the finishing cut so I never lose the initial accurate location. Of course, one disadvantage of faceplate work is that you do fling coolant everywhere and if you're just on a manual lathe without an enclosure, it's going to get a bit messy, but it's all right because you're usually only making a one-off part on a faceplate. When you're drilling out the pilot hole, when the drill breaks through and the part is spinning, have a careful look at it to make sure it's not got a wobble in it before you put in the final size drill prior to boring because you don't want drill wander that destroys your expensive prototype part. When you've got irregular shaped parts like this it's a good idea to wind the tool right in till it's coming out the back end. Check that you've got clearance that nothing's going to snag. You don't want to be checking that for the first cut while it's all spinning. So now that we've finished board the inside uh, we've transferred our datum from the outside flats to that bore um, we can double check it that nothing's moved and then we can uh, machine the outside because we've got the new datum of the inside bore to check our concentricity hasn't shifted. During the manufacture of this part and a similar project, I've taken a lot of clips or scenes and there's a lot of different tips and tricks, probably too many to put into one video. So I'll probably split them up into about three videos. So um, I'll, I'll finish this video up here, um, but please come back and have a look for uh, future videos on this project full of tips and tricks. If you'd like to see more of this type of video, Please remember to like and subscribe. That will help with the YouTube algorithms and uh, make it more readily available for other viewers.